Homocysteine has been around for a while in the news about its relationship to heart disease. Uh, this is even just a partial list. The question is, what is homocysteine and its, its effect here? It increases the risk of insulin resistance, metabolic syndromes, diabetes, development of cardiovascular disease. Again, are those things similar to things we've been talking about already? Interferes with the production of nitric oxide and alters elastic properties of arteries. And at the very bottom, we'll skip down there, MTHFR plays a role in the risk factor gene interaction in atherosclerosis. So, you need to hang with me. I don't want to lose anybody here. I'll try and bring this all together because we're, has anybody ever heard of MTHFR before? Two, three people. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you'll study this hard and memorize it, okay, <laughs> this, is the, this is the metabolic pathways of the body. Okay. This is very complex. This is how the body works right here, if you understood this. Now, biochemists love this because they, they just eat this stuff up. But if we zeroed in on one little tiny area up in about the top right center area, this is what we would see. And this is basically what these metabolic pathways are about. They're just circles that go in circles and move chemicals. And one transfers it, and then it transfers it, and then it transfers it, and there's gears that just go all over. And so if I have a metabolic pathway blockage, if there's something that's not working, then the other gears that are dependent on that pathway working then have some impairment or don't work. It's just the way the body works. There's three that we're going to zero in on here as it relates to our discussion today, and that is the folic acid pathway, the methylation cycle, and transsulfuration. And there'll be some surprising um, ahas here I think some of you will have. If not, I'll guide you to make them because this is, I think, very significant uh, and should, in my opinion, guide a lot of research and dentistry in the future. The biggie here is the methylation cycle. <clears throat> A methyl group is a CH3 group. It's called single uh, carbon chemistry. And, and methyl groups are very, very important. And, and homocysteine at the bottom of that cycle becomes methylated, or it receives a methyl from a methyl donor, and becomes methionine, which is an amino acid that we can also acquire from our diet. And that's converted into s adenosyl methionine, or we call SAM, which becomes the primary methyl donor in the body for a host of biological reactions, including the DNA, production and so forth. And we'll, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. The methyl group comes to the homocysteine from the folic acid pathway. That's, that's the donor cycle. And so this isn't about just getting folic acid because folic acid has to go through four steps before it becomes capable of being biologically active to give the methyl group. So folic acid, uh, 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 vitamin B9, in our diet, okay, the, through, or through a supplement, is converted to folinic acid and then to 5,10-methylene tetrahydrofolate. And then because of MTHFR, or methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, that converts it to a 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, or we just call it L-methylfolate, or folate for short. That now is the biologically active molecule that can give the methyl group to the homocysteine molecule that converts homocysteine to methionine. As that process happens, then I can reduce my homocysteine level. But that's how I can get rid of homocysteine, is by the B vitamins working and making this methyl donor work, okay? At the bottom in the transsulfuration pathway, this is more the detoxification area, uh, homocysteine can also be nudged into cystothionine and cysteine, um, which is the precursor for glutathione, metallothionine, and sulfate, and taurine. So looking at it a little differently when we sketch this out, we have the methyl cycle here and we have the folic acid cycle here. We've got MTHFR as the enzyme that makes this last conversion. And, and we'll have to say that if I have an MTHFR polymorphism or a genetic defect, then that means I can't make this last conversion in the folic acid pathway that gives me the biologically active folate that can give up the, uh, the methyl group that makes homocysteine. So that means if I have an MTHFR gene defect, I'm not going to be able, I'm going to have problems here making these gears work, is the bottom line. I can't get rid of my homocysteine. Plus, when I have a, when I'm, when I'm oxidatively challenged, when I'm under stress oxidatively, or when I'm burdened with heavy metals or other xenobiotics, what it does is it shunts the, the, the cysteine beta synthetase, the CBS, which coactives with B6 uh, and zinc, 
it pushes the equation and shunts it down into this bottom transsulfuration pathway because the body is more concerned about protecting itself from damage than it is making the methyl group go so that I can make DNA and cell proteins and, and cell walls and so forth. So it shunts it down in here, down to where the GSH is the glutathione, the, glut the, met the uh, metallothionine, the glutathione, the sulfate, and the taurine are all related and have very active roles in removing heavy metals from my body. This is how I, this is how I get rid of intra and, and extracellular heavy metal. It conjugates, it chelates, and prepares them for excretion. So the question becomes, well, upstream, if I have an MTHFR defect, what happens downstream in these metabolic pathways, and why as a dentist should I care? Why does nutrition matter in periodontal disease, in wound healing, in, in oxidative stress reduction, and so forth? When you get into this level, you start, hmm, there's some really interesting conclusions that we could make here because Clinically, um, why is it that someone can have lots of amalgam in their mouth, lots of heavy metal burden, and they're just fine? And someone else can have a little bit, and they're not just fine. What's the question that historically we've not asked yet? Do you have an MTHFR polymorphism? That's the question that has not been asked in any of the research with regards to uh, mercury safety or heavy metal work. What's the status of the transsulfuration pathway of the methylation pathway and the folic acid pathway? We haven't asked that question yet in any of the research that I've seen. <clears throat> so people with an MTHFR polymorphism have difficulty converting folic acid to the L-methylfolate and making these cycles work. That's, that's what the take home here. Uh, interestingly, that's what, uh, that's what is um, affected or what we can affect via diet, which is why nutrition is so important. Every one of those we can do something with metabolically because if I have an inborn error of metabolism and I don't have the ability to make that last conversion to the biologically active folate, I'm never going to get it. That's mom and dad's fault and I am forever blocked. That's an innate inborn error of metabolism. So now I have to be thinking, how do I get this working? How do I get around that? How do I do a workaround so that I can provide the body with what it needs to methylate? to get the methylation cycle working. And fortunately, there's ways we can do that through proper supplementation. And I think it has some profound implications for heavy metal toxicity and for detoxification. I mean, I, I don't know that I need to go there, but if everybody's thinking about what this means for dentistry and the debate, the great amalgam debate, it's like suddenly, you know, I, I just read a, a recent, very brand new report that came out about how safe amalgam is. Um, you know, that stack of literature is this tall. And on the other side is this one over here, but neither has looked at this yet. I think it needs to be done and all that research needs to be redone. <clears throat>